why would we want to have our largest corporations paying more taxes to foreign governments, some of which we're completely opposed to uh, in a political sense? Why would we want to subsidize them? You know, so it doesn't, it really, you know, there, there's a real problem there because that gives the large multinational every incentive to operate overseas and still have every benefit of the U.S. system. And therefore, they end up paying less taxes and getting all the benefits internationally of being a U.S. company. Anytime they have a problem, who pays for it? U.S. taxpayers. because we'll send in the big bad military. If there's really a big problem, it's just unfortunate that things are the way they are that way, because if we could reform the tax code so that foreign taxes could not be written off against U.S. earnings, that would drive jobs back here. Further, if you offered a zero percent tax rate to U.S. multinationals based on the percentage of their workforce that bears U.S. citizenship and also a specific level of minimum compensation so that the effect was that the tax load was shifted to the employees, then you'd have every incentive to create jobs, you know, because you'd tie the job creation in with the ability to achieve the 0% rate so that you're actually employing U.S. citizens and by doing so, turning them into taxpayers. The citizens actually pay the taxes that the corporation would be avoiding. It's a damn shame. You know, I mean, we've we've got a, a great country, uh, you know, with so much potential. But 5,000 years of human history shows time and time again that there are certain facets of human nature that always step in and say a great ci uh, civilization will rise and it will fall. And that cycle has repeated itself, you know, dozens of times in recorded history. You know, some of those nations don't exist anymore, and some of them exist in, in a m much more humble form than they once occupied. That looks to be our fate since we've not yet come up with the solution to the problems that really drive those evolutionary processes within a society, which is, on an individual basis, unregulated human desires that are inherent, apparently, in our existence, where... You know, some people just cannot contain their needs and they have to infringe upon other people and gorge to the point of excess. You know, if you ex examine Roman history, there are some facets of today that look real similar. Like right before the fall of Rome, the games that they would put on in the Colosseum became ever more extravagant. You know, and then you look at sports today and and compare it to 50 years ago, sports were, I mean, there was a big deal, but now it's, you know, it's a huge industry full of excess to, you know, grandiose proportions. And, you know, in, compare that to the, the history of Rome and, the, and then observe the instability that we have in our society and the fact that we're ignoring the real problems. And it, it looks to me like we're repeating the same process that's so well documented now in human history. We're repeating the same process that occurred in Rome with our monetary system. Right before the, the final collapse of the, the Roman Empire, they started making changes to their currency. You know, finally, the metals that were once used became too valuable, so they started finding cheaper alternatives. And we did that quite some time ago now. And, and here it is, we're, the difference being that the globalization of the entire world and, and with most nations playing some part of the, uh, on this, the world stage, the phenomenon where a globalized currency has finally occurred. So it's, we were able to put ourselves in a position where the U.S. dollar was, is the world's dominant currency. So now it, it's allowed us to extend, I think, the process of pre-collapse to a much larger proportion than was than has ever been documented in human history because you've got 65 percent of global cash reserves and 85 percent of electronic cash transactions you know forex that kind of trading those are denominated in the u.s dollars historically when when there's been a danger in an investment investors are much faster to get to the door than they are to pile in and that can be shown on stock charts anywhere you know, the, the upward trend on the best stock chart 
doesn't match the downward trend on the worst any day of the week. So when everybody starts realizing that there's a problem with the U.S. dollar and that it's it's all just paper now, um, you know they're going to start piling for the door. And the only thing that's been stopping them is that we're we're not the worst looking story in the book. But sooner or later, history proves time and time again countries get to a certain level of debt and they their currency collapses. And we are almost there. We're within a lifetime for sure, but some people might say two or three years. And the math supports it. It was looked into selling off pieces of land to, who is it, China that we owe the most to? No, actually, that's a, that's a common misconception. Uh, the USA currently carries about $16 trillion in national debt. And of that, only about 10% is owed to China. Most people are not aware of the fact that about $11 trillion of our current national debt is held by the U.S. public and the Federal Reserve. China is our largest foreign debtor, but they are not our largest debt. And everybody has the misconception. There's so many people out there that do not understand that. And there's actually a a very interesting phenomenon in the relationship between the USA and China that a lot of people think China is the bad guy. But in actuality, China is one of the reasons why the U.S. dollar is still functioning and still the strongest currency in terms of penetration in the trading markets and its uses in the economic world in terms of denominating different assets. So the reason why the dollar has maintained its strength is because China wishes to have access to our markets. So they pinned their currency to ours so that they'd have a stable exchange rate, and they started investing heavily in dollars to maintain the strength of our currency as the economic conditions have deteriorated over the last 25 years. So a lot of people are not aware of all that China has actually done for us, because without their consistent investment in U.S. dollars, our economy would have failed a long time ago. And now China has the world's largest cash reserves of, of any entity, as far as I'm aware, at least publicly disclosed, at you know several trillion dollars. And a large portion of their holdings are tied up in U.S. dollars. So that you know they they have a vested interest in the strength of the U.S. dollar because if the if the U.S. dollar were to crash, then they would lose access to their single largest market, and in that process, you know, a hundred million jobs or more. And in a country like China, with the tight controls over the populace, if you have an unsettling event like the loss of a hundred million jobs over the span of a few months that's going to degrade into complete chaos. So that's, that's a very legitimate fear, very publicly disclosed, that portion of it is. Uh, but that's, you know, a lot of people just are not aware of the interaction between the two countries. The real danger on the world stage is actually Russia. Most people are not aware of the fact that Russia is the world's largest exporter of oil, and they're not aware of the moves that were that were made by the government to nationalize the oil companies. And by doing so, you know, they basically are the largest player in the most important commodity in the world. And they have the least interest in the health of our economy because they have the least amount of financial exposure of any country with their economic size. We have almost no trading with them compared to China. So, you know, China has a vested interest in our economic health. Russia has a vested interest in our economic collapse because then they would be able to take over as, uh, you know, the, the world's predominantly traded currency. Or, you know, they'd at least have a, an opportunity to uh, make powerful inroads, which then uh, gives you certain advantages in world trading. Tie in the rise of gold and our actions in the Middle East. Most people are not aware of the moves that were being made by Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein regarding their desire to exit trading oil in U.S. dollars. That, those moves were designed by those two leaders or their advisors as a means to undermine the U.S. dollar. Because if they had been able to successfully transition away from trading oil for dollars and then into oil to, for gold, 
they would have made a higher level of profit, which then would have encouraged many other nations to move in the same direction, thereby creating the, the collapse of the dollar, which is why our country had to go in and de defend our currency against those uh, uh, intentions. Gaddafi went on the record uh, quite some time ago before he was killed uh, regarding his desire to create an African currency based on gold and to trade his country's oil in that uh, in that new currency in, and not use dollars. And the, the only intention for that would be to maximize profits and or damage the U.S. dollar. And during that period of time as gold rose, which, you know, it's been flat for about a year, but previous to that, it had risen for 10 years plus. If you analyze the purchases made by large foreign entities, Russia was one of the largest buyers. Why? Undermining the U.S. dollar. It was a good investment as well. And they only tapered off their purchasing as gold had rose to the point where it is today. And even then, when you actually look at not the weight, but the value of what they're investing, it's been pretty consistent over the last 10 years that Russia has dumped in a lot of money into gold. The only reason for that is if they thought they were going to make a profit and or hurt the U.S. dollar. So out of any country in the world who would have the resources and the desires to create economic havoc in the USA, who would have the ability to come up with a plan like that and then disseminate it to uh, Middle Eastern leaders like Saddam Hussein and, and Gaddafi, who probably did not have the human assets available to them to design such an action?